ಅಭಿನಾಖೇಧಾಯು ಜಗಾಥ ಸಂಸಾರೆ ಥೋಮ ಭಿನಾಖೇಧಾಯು ಜಗಾಥ ಸಂಸಾರೆ ಪತಿತ ಪವನ್ನ ಹೇತು ತವಾಬತಾರ ಪತಿತ ಪವನ್ನ ಹೇತು ತವಾಬತಾರ ಮೋಸ ಮೋಪತಿ ಪ್ರಭು ನ ಪೈ ಬೇಯಾರ ಮೋಸ ಮೋಪತಿ ಪ್ರಭು ನ ಪೈ ಬೇಯಾರ ಹಾಹ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಪ್ರೇಮಾನಂದ ಸುಖಿ ಹಾಹ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಪ್ರೇಮಾನಂದ ಸುಖಿ ಕೃಪಾ ಬೋಲೋ ಖನ್ನ ಕೊರೋ ಅಮಿ ಬಾರದು ಕಿ ಕೃಪಾ ಬೋಲೋ ಖನ್ನ ಕೊರೋ ಅಮಿ ಬಾರದು ಕಿ ದಯ ಕೋರೋ ಸೀತಪತಿ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗೊಸ ದಯ ಕೋರೋ ಸೀತಪತಿ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗೊಸ ತವ ಕೃಪ ಭೋಲೆ ಪೈ ಚೈತನ್ಯಾನಿತ ತವ ಕೃಪ ಭೋಲೆ ಪೈ ಚೈತನ್ಯಾನಿತ aha swarup sanatan rupa raguna aha swarup sanatan 
Rupa Raguna Bata Yuga Shri Jiva Prabhu Lokana Bata Yuga Shri Jiva Prabhu Lokana Daya Koro Shri Acharya Prabhu Shri Nivas Daya Koro Shri Acharya Prabhu Shri Nivas Ramachandra Sangamage Naratamadas Ramachandra Sangamage Naratamadas Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Daya Karamore Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Daya Karamore Toma bina ke dayalu jagata samsahare Toma bina ke dayalu jagata samsahare Nittai Gaur Haribo 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 Nittai Gaur Haribo Nittai Gaur Premanande Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudirayat Nasta Preshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke 
Bhaktir Bhavati Nashtaki. So the, this morning we're going to speak on the pastimes of Dhruva Maharaj. They are described in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, beginning chapter number eight. And we will hear how Dhruva Maharaj performed his austerities. So the chapter begins, it describes about the two sons of Swayambhuva Manu. Swayambhuva Manu had three daughters, Achuta, uh, Akuti, Devahuti and Prashuti. And he had two sons who were very special sons. They were empowered by the personality of Godhead. One son was Priyavrat and the other son Uttanapad. So Uttanapad had two wives, Suniti and Suruchi. S and naturally you have two wives. One wife was more attractive than the other. He was more inclined towards one wife ra rather than the, He was more inclined towards Suruchi. And Suniti was a bit neglected. It says actually she was not even like a maidservant. She wasn't even as good as a maidservant. And she had practically no position, although she was the wife one of the wives of Uttanapad. And each of the two wives had a son. Suniti's son was Dhruva and Suruchi's son was Uttama. So it happened that one day Uttanapad was sitting on his throne talking to his wife, his favorite wife, Suruchi, and her son was there on the lap of the father. So at that time, Dhruva also came, just a young boy, a few years old. And he saw Uttama playing on the lap of his father, and he thought, I also want to be there, because it's also his father. So. It's also his father, so he uh, tried to climb onto the lap of his father. But when he tried to get up on the lap of his father, then stepmother spoke to him and told him that you cannot sit there. You're not qualified to sit there. You want to sit there first you will have to give up your body, you have to perform austerities, and then if you're fortunate, you can take birth again in my womb, and then you will be able to sit on the lap of your father. Then you will be able to sit on his lap. So these words were not spoken of in a very gentle manner, very harsh words. And the young boy was very much affected by the cruel words. Even the, the father, Uttanapad, did not say anything. He did not even chastise the woman and say, why you speak like that, he's only a little. He did not say anything because he was controlled by the woman. So, you know, it's a nature sometimes like that, material world. People speak words which are harsh, which are not pleasing. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells us that in the mode of goodness, if you want to cultivate the mode of goodness, we should speak words which are pleasing and which are honest 
hmm, which are beneficial. But Thiruchi, Thiruchi spoke in such a harsh way. So Dhruva was very disturbed and he was crying and he came, he left the room and he went to find his mother. He was crying and he was so upset he could not even tell his mother what happened. All of the other members in the palace, all of the servants, they knew what had happened. They had heard the words of Suruchi and they told Suniti that it, what had happened and what had been said. And when Suniti heard these words, then she also began to cry. So both Dhruva and his mother were crying. What to do? A pathetic situation. And of course Dhruva was appealing to his mother. Why like that? Why is my father, why I, he's my father, why I cannot sit on his lap? And of course Suniti has to tell the boy, tell her son, that you're unfortunate. I am, you're my son, so you're unfortunate. Because I am the neglected wife, I am not the favorite wife of your father. So I, this is the problem. It's my fault that you're born as my son, so you're unfortunate. Actually, when Suruchi was talking harshly to Dhruva, she told him that you should go and worship the personality of Godhead. And by doing austerities, then your next life you may be fortunate to take birth in my womb. So Suniti also told Dhruva Maharaj that actually it's true that if you go to the Supreme Lord, he can fulfill your desires. He can help you. He's the one to help. When people are in distress, they go to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he can help them in their distress. You, 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 you have to take to the process of devotion and worship him and please him. At the same time, Suniti also told her son, you should not want to do any harm to anyone. Because if you do harm to someone, then that pain which they undergo will come back to you. That's a very important point to remember. That if we cause pain and suffering to a person, then that pain and suffering will come back on us. That is the law of material nature. So. Suniti was giving good instruction to her son and she was telling her son, you have to worship the Supreme Lord. It's the only way in which you can actually get relief from your distress. So then Dhruva Maharaj was inquiring from his mother where, where to find the Lord. Where is he? And so she told him that when people want to find the Lord, many people go to the, go to the forest. They go there. And so then Dhruva Maharaj, although he was a little child, but because he is born in the Kshatriya family, he has that very passionate nature. And he's also very bold. He's not afraid of anything. He 
does not know fear. He is very full of courage. So Dhruva Maharaj told his mother, I will go to the forest. I will find him. So Dhruva Maharaj left his home. And as he was going out from the house, he met with Narada Muni. Because Narada Muni had heard about the situation. Narada Muni had heard what had been happening and he was concerned, he took interest. So he came and he met with Dhruva and he told Dhruva that, you know, what you want to do, you want to take to this process of mystic yoga you're trying to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You know, it's very difficult and it's very rare that people are successful in their attempts. So I don't advise you to do it. You're just a young boy and young boys of your age, they like to play games and sports they want to do these things. So, you know, don't worry about all this mystic yoga. And thi don't be so affected by the harsh words of your stepmother. Better you just go home and wait till you grow up. When you're older, then you can think about these things. And generally, well, the Vedic system is that in older age, then that is the time for self-realization, for practice of spiritual life. The Vedic system, of course, it begins with brahmacharya. So in the beginning also, some training is there. And then grihastha life, is there, but that grihastha life is not forever. It comes to an end and you go on to vanaprastha. The Vedas say pancha sodvam vanam brajet. From the age of 50 you have to go to the forest. You should go and prepare for the next life. The meaning is that Half the life is over. At, when you're 50, half the life, at, at least half the life is over. If you're lucky. How many people live to be 100? Not many. So we have, it takes time to prepare for the next life. So th the idea, the Vedic civilization was made in such a way that people would retire from work. You, you know, in, in countries like USA, there's no retirement age. People just work and work and work till they drop. That is not very great. You work like an ass, next life you'll be born as an ass. So it, it is not the proper use of the human life. Human life is meant for self-realization and we have to take some time for that. So preparation is required and means vanaprastha, retirement. And with retirement also some renunciation. Sannyas is not required for everyone, but, but detachment is required for everyone. We have to detach ourselves from the material. Anyway, Narada was telling Dhruva Maharaj, you know, don't take these words so seriously. You're just a young boy. Just wait till you grow up then you can think about going to the forest 
and doing mystic yoga. But, oh, oh, Narada also said, he gave very important instruction. He, Narada said that you have to learn that those people who are senior to you, we should be happy to meet them. And those people who are your equals, make friends with them. And those people who are junior to you, show compassion on them. Very important instruction. Usually, we don't deal with people in that way. Someone is senior to us, there'll be some envy there, and we will want to avoid them, to stay away from them. And people who are equals, we will try to compete with them. And those people who are junior than us, we will exploit them. Because we have envy, we have that n n envious nature. So we deal with people in this way. So Narada Muni was instructing Dhruva to give up envy, to look at people in a, a nice way and think of how we can be benefited by them and how we can benefit others also. So Narada Muni said like this to Dhruva, very important instructions. He said, don't think of doing harm to people. Think about how you can do good for them. Dhruva Maharaj said, oh, y your instructions are very nice. He addresses Narada, Lord Narada, your instructions are very good, but I'm a Kshatriya. I don't have that nature. That se stepmother of mine has pierced my heart with her harsh words. And I want to go to the forest and I want to get a kingdom greater than anybody else, greater than my father and greater than my grandfather. Grandfather means Swayambhuva Manu, right? So he said, I want to have a kingdom greater than all of them. This was his desire. So Dhruva Maharaj is, of course, the example we usually give of a person who takes up devotional service with material desires. Sometimes people think, oh, you have to be pure to take up bhakti yoga. But even we have material desires we can also practice bhakti. The Bhagavad Gita describes chatur vidabhajantimam jnana sukriti no arjuna arto jignasur art arti jnani cha bharatarshaba jnana mm. sukriti no arjuna. He, Lord Krishna is describing four kinds of people who take up Krishna consciousness or bhakti yoga. And they're not pure devotees, you know. They, people don't come to Krishna consciousness as pure devotees. We come with different desires. Some people come in distress. That's the most common. Many of us, we're in distress because the material world is full of distress. There's a lot of trouble in the material world. So we come to Krishna consciousness to get some relief from the distress. Other people come, like Dhruva Maharaj, in search of some material wealth. They want some gain. And that's also expected People need to 
enjoy something, to get some uh, economic benefit. So that people may come to Krishna with that kind of thought. And other people are curious, and some other people come in search of knowledge. So they're, they're, they're all pious people. They all have sukriti, but they have their motives also, right? Karma Mishra Bhakti, Jnana Mishra Bhakti, that is not pure devotion. If you have, if you, if we come, it's not pure devotion. What we want to do is to come to the level of pure devotion. But that, that comes about by practice of devotion. And we see also Dhruva Maharaj, he, in the course of his practice, he also became pure devotee. Distress, usually we give the example of Gajendra, the elephant. Elephants can also take, uh, animals can also take up bhakti yoga. Of course, Gajendra was a very special elephant, but he was in great distress with the crocodile attacking him. But he became purified. And then example of people who were curious, we have the sages in Naimasharanya. They're inquiring from Sutta Goswami. They have many questions to ask. If you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first chapter, questions by the sages and they came to Naimisharanya to inquire like, wh where are the religious principles in the Kali Yuga and all of these kind of things. So curious people and then people in search of knowledge, the four Kumaras, the four Kumaras, they're Jnana Bhakta, the Jnana Mishra Bhakta. They have devotion, but it's mixed with desire for knowledge, the four Kumaras. So Dhruva Maharaj is the classic example of someone who wants something material. And what does he want? He wants a kingdom greater than anybody else. You know, a very ambitious person, you know. So... Narada Muni saw the determination of Dhruva Maharaj. So he, he saw that he's ve very serious and very sincere also. This, this is important that the spiritual teacher wants to test the disciple before he will accept someone as a student. They will test him. They're not going to immediately say, all right, yes, yes, you can be my... They want to test that person to see how serious are they to be a devotee. And Narada was testing Dhruva by telling him, go home, come back when you grow up. He wanted to see how serious he is. So... Srila Prabhupada also would test devotees. Before being initiated, we would first of all have to go live in the ashram and practice Krishna consciousness. Shave our heads, put on the cloth of the devotee, wear the dhoti and so on, and go out for book distribution and perform Sankirtan. Not that, oh yes, I'm coming to temple so I can get initiation. Srila Prabhupada wanted to see us that we would surrender to Krishna, that we were serious to become Krishna conscious. So this testing by the spiritual master, this is, and actually, Disciple should also test the guru. 
it goes both ways. It's not just the guru will test the disciple, disciple should test the guru. How should they test? Well, they should put questions to him and they should, be, th we, they, sh they should expect to get satisfactory answers. They should be satisfied with the explanations of the of this spiritual master. It's not just, oh yeah, I want initiation, no, okay, yeah, you want initiation, oh, fill in the form, okay, you can be initiated. No. Some testing period will be there. We want to see who is genuine, who really wants to become Krishna conscious. So Narada tested Dhruva Maharaj. He tried to discourage him. Don't better go home. Come back when you grow up. But Dhruva was very determined. He wanted to get his desire. So then Narada Muni gave him instruction. Just like when the spiritual master sees that you are a little serious about Krishna consciousness, then he will give instruction. He will say things like, you must get up by four o'clock at the latest in the morning. You should get up four o'clock in the morning and you should chant at least 16 rounds every day and you should just eat prasadam, these kind of things. You should study, you should read the books. So Dhruva also got instructions from Narada Muni. Narada Muni told Dhruva, he gave him a place to stay. Just like spiritual master may say, you go and stay in the ashram. You go to this, go to the temple and you stay there. So Narada Muni told Dhruva Maharaj, you go to Madhuvan. Madhuvan, one of the places in Vrindavan. And if you go to Vrindavan, how many of you have been to Vrindavan? Not, not very many. Eh? How about half? So if you go to Vrindavan, you can see this Madhuvan, the place where Dhruva Maharaj performed his tapasya. And it's on the banks of the Yamuna. The Yamuna is at least the time of Dhruva Maharaj, water was very clear, very pure. I don't know how it is today, my goodness. The rivers, so many factories, so much pollution. Anyway, Narada tells Dhruva, you go there to Madhuvan and you stay there. And on the banks of the Yamuna, you can take bath three times a day. This is uh, Vedic injunction. Is it? Is it? Brahmacharis take bath one, should take at least once a day. Grihastas should take bath twice a day. Sannyasis should take bath three times a day. So Dhruva Maharaj was being given instructions by Narada. And he also Narada also gave a mantra to chant. Of course the mantra was Right, yeah, we're chanting every day, right? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So Narada Muni gave this mantra to Dhruva Maharaj and told him, you worship Lord Narayan by chanting this mantra. And he also told him to make a form of Lord Narayan and worship the form and offer flowers offer the flowers and whatever grows there in the forest, 
and worship the form. And it, it's all the Narada Muni also described the form of Lord Narayan. He gives an elaborate description. It's there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So in this way, Narada Muni gave instructions to Dhruva what he should do. So Dhruva then went into the forest and he found a place, quiet place on the bank of the Yamuna and he resided there. He constructed his deity and he had an asana to sit on and he began to worship the Lord. And it describes during the first month he would eat only some fruit and berries which were growing locally. Mm, things which were just found there in the forest. In the forest there were many different trees so he was able to get some fruit and flowers. And berries, these kind of things. He was and he would eat these things during the first month. The second month became a little, he decided he should do a little more austerity. So instead of eating fruit and berries, the second month he would only eat dry leaves and grass. And he would not eat every day. He'd only eat every three days. So in this way, he was doing austerity. Just like today is Ekadasi. We do some austerity on the Ekadasi. Very important for us. Because every day we eat, and probably you eat, three times a day, is it? Most of you eat three meals a day. Uh, the, the Buddhist monks, and, 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 and you know, if you go to a country like Thailand where they have Buddhism, sometimes they will ask you, how many meals do you eat a day? You know, because the monks, they only eat two meals a day. Usually people eat three meals, but the monks, they won't eat in the afternoon. They only eat two meals. They'll eat in the morning, and they eat in the midday, and that's for the rest of the day. They don't eat. And, and Srila Prabhupada, when I first became a devotee in, the, in London, Srila Prabhupada had told all the devotees, don't eat grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. He didn't want us to eat heavy food in the night. But people, they, they don't know this. They have the, we have all the wrong standards. People often go out to work all day, come home at night and eat the full meal. Big meal at night. It's not proper. According to Ayurveda, the power of digestion is controlled by the sun. As the sun rises, the power of digestion increases. The digestive powers are maximum when the sun is at full point in the sky. And as the sun sets, then digestion goes down. So you eat heavy food at night, you won't digest very well. It means you wake up in the morning, you'll feel tired because you didn't digest the food properly. This knowledge is known not only in Ayurveda. In China, Chinese medicine, they also know this. They, they have a saying which is in China. They say, eat a good breakfast, eat a full lunch, and eat less in the night. Dhruva Maharaj, he was only eating every three days, you know. He was not an f 
First day, first month, it was berries and fruit. Second month, dry leaves. Third month, stopped eating, just taking water. He would just take a little water, sip water. You can live just taking water. There are some people they do like, they can fast just on water for a month, several months, they can do it. You can do that. So Dhruva Maharaj, the third month, he was just taking water. Then the fourth month, he stopped taking also water. And instead, he was controlling his breathing. He was doing the pranayama. Prabhupada calls it the nose pressing yoga. You know? You know? <laughs> yeah. Do any of you do pranayama here? Who does pranayama? Be honest. Nobody. You don't know anything, you people. Huh? <laughs> pranayama. In the past, everybody knew these things. Everyone knew how to meditate, how to do pranayama. Everyone would learn these things. Very good for health. Prana you can live a long, you want to live a long time? You can do pranayama. Uh, this man, you know that one man, uh, Art of Living, they teach this pranayama. He's made a fortune teaching this pranayama to people. They teach it to people. Famous, he's famous all over the world, teaching pranayama. He's a big Mayavadi. Anyway, we also can practice Astanga Yoga. It's also part, it can also be part of the Bhakti Yoga system. So pranayama is not, not such a bad thing. A little, li little while a day, not hours a day, but Anyway, Dhruva Maharaj, the fourth month, he was doing pranayama, he was controlling his breathing. Then the fifth month, he stood on one leg. <laughs> Have you tried it? Standing on one leg? <laughs> he stood on one leg, and he was standing perfectly erect. and str He wasn't, you know, <laughs> you know, he wasn't shaking or wobbling or anything. He was very stiff and erect, and he was standing on only one leg and controlling his breathing. And his, his tapasya, it, it began to take effect all over the universe. That all the demigods began to suffocate. They could... Because he was not breathing, he was suppressing his breathing and standing on one leg and the power of his one toe was uh, pushing down the whole planet and all the demigods in heaven were suffocating. So they all went to see Lord Vishnu. They went, what is going on? They were requesting Lord Vishnu Please, what is going on? We cannot breathe. What is happening? You are our only shelter. Please tell us what is wrong. And the Lord told the demigods that this is the result of the son of Uttanapada. He is doing austerities. And because of his austerities, you are all suffocating. He said, but I will go, th the Lord told them, don't worry, I will go there and see him and adjust the situation. So th this is what happened in chapter 8 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Dhruva Maharaj had gone to the forest, he'd done great tapasya, six months tapasya. Within six months, he was, Tapasya was so powerful and so great that the Lord of the universe came to see him. So, 
it's very instructive for all of us. We should also do tapasya. Lord Rishavdev also told his sons, Nayam deho dehabajam nareloke kushtam kamar nahate vidbajam ye tejo divyam putrakayena sadvam shudayad jasmad brahmashokyam twananta. This is one of Srila Prabhupada's favorite verses for lecturing on. It's Lord Rishavdev telling his sons to do tapasya. Don't try to enjoy like the hogs and the dogs, but do some austerity and purify yourself. And we are seeing Dhruva Maharaj also purified himself. He went to the forest with material desires. But the result of his austerities because he had been associate, because he got instruction from Narada Muni, and Narada Muni, he, you know, he's a devotee, so he gave instructions to Dhruva in such a way that Dhruva will not only get his material desires, but he will also get devotion. It is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the second canto, Akama Sarvakamo Va Moksha Kama Udharadi Right. Whether one has all material desires or no material desires or desires liberation, in whatever condition, you should worship the Supreme Lord. So Narada Muni had directed Dhruva, you worship the Lord. He gave him the mantra. He t told him how to worship the deity. He told him to do these things. And Dhruva did it. And the result was that he got his he's going to get his material desires, but he's also going to get darshan of the personality of Godhead. The Lord is going to come to him and Dhruva is going to regret his mistake. He will understand that he had gone there with material desires. And Dhruva says that these da desires which I had, they were just like broken glass. This, they, they had no, they have no, to want such a big kingdom, to want a kingdom at all, it is, he compares it to wanting broken glass. It has no value. Why? Because it is temporary. How long can you be in possession of a kingdom? How long can you keep the kingdom? You can be born the king. How long will you be the king for? <laughs> Recently, of course, the Queen of England died and her son became the king. Her son, well, the queen was 96, I think, when she died. So her son was, a, he must have been s s maybe 70. Huh? Late 70s, yeah, so become the king, you know. <laughs> Are you going to enjoy <laughs> late 70s? You know, what can you do? It's not really the time to become the king. Because Vedas say from the age of 50 you're meant to retire because you have to prepare for the next life. So he should also be thinking to prepare for the next life, not just, I'm the king. <laughs> How long you can be the king for? It's a very temporary thing. You have to give up the king. And then next life, where will you go? So we have to think about the future. And Dhruva Maharaj was a young boy, five years old, they say. He'd gone to the forest. And in six months, 
he was able to have the darshan of the personality of Godhead. Now when Dhruva Maharaj went into the forest, at that time Narada Muni went to see the father, Maharaj Uttanapad. And Narada came into the palace and he saw Uttanapad. He saw, he said to him, he said, Oh, you look, you look like something is disturbing you. What's wrong? You look pale. You don't look very healthy. You don't look very lively. You're not, you don't look happy. What is wrong? What is, what is troubling you in your mind? Tell me, what's wrong? And Maharaj Uttanapad then spoke to Narad and told him that, you know, I have neglected my wife. I've neglected my one of my wives. I've neglected Suniti. And I've, because of my neglect of Suniti, because of my attraction to Suruchi, I have neglected the son born of Suniti. And I've neglected him, and he's gone off to the forest. And he's only a young boy. And there's so many dangers there. The wolves, the jackals may come and eat him. How can he survive in the forest? There's so many wild animals there. How will we ever survive? And it's all my fault. So Uttanapad was lamenting how he had neglected to care for his son. But Narada, of course, was able to console Uttanapad and told him that don't worry. Actually, your son is safe because he is meditating on the personality of Godhead. And he's going to bring great honor to the family. And you also, your name will become famous because you are the father of such a great devotee. It says in the, in the scriptures, Prahlad Maharaj said, do not become a father unless you can deliver your children from birth and death. And do not become a teacher unless you can deliver your students from birth and death. It's a responsibility. And so Narada is telling Uttanapad, you're so fortunate your son has brought glory to your dynasty by his devotion. That he's there in the forest and he's doing great austerities and the Lord is going to come to see him, to fulfill his desires. So we won't go any further today. Are there any questions? Anyone? Yes? Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandar Pranams. Thank you for enlightening us. The determination which Dhruva Maharaj had, why all people cannot have that kind of determination, especially those who are practicing Krishna consciousness in ISKCON. Our determination seems to be very, very light compared to Dhruva Maharaja's uh, fiery determination. So why we should, why we cannot get that kind of a determination? This is my question. Well, you can, you can get that kind of determination if you want it. We have to give up sense gratification. Because we are inclined so much to sense gratification, it takes away our determination. So Dhruva Maharaj must have, by his, from his previous life, he must have had some very, very powerful some scars. Because he's born, first of all, in a very great family. Swayambhuvamanu was the, the grandfather. So Swayambhuva Manu is one of the sons of Brahma. So very, very big birth, not an ordinary birth. 
we are just common people. Swayambhuva Manu was one of the sons of Brahma. And Swayambhuva Manu was the father of Uttanapad, who was the father of Dhruva. So try to understand it was a very powerful birth. He was born in a very great family, a very noble family. So he must have had a lot of some scars from the previous birth also. It's not by chance that someone is in that position and has that nature, but it's developed as a result of their past activities. They cultivated that. We are on the path by coming into ISKCON, by accepting initiation into ISKCON, we're on the path of developing our qualification for austerity of God. Austerity is not th really the goal, but the goal is bhakti, devotion. And where there is bhakti, then there will be jnana and vairagya. Where there is genuine bhakti, then it's automatically followed that there will be transcendental knowledge and detachment from the world of sense gratification. These two things must follow where there is genuine devotion. So Dhruva Maharaj was certainly very austere and he was also fortunate. He was blessed with the association of great devotee. He got instructions from Sri Narada Muni and he took the instructions very seriously. He very strictly followed all the instructions which had been given to him. So if we follow the instructions given to us, we will be greatly benefited. Certainly, Srila Prabhupada gave us instructions we have to follow them carefully. What is required? Sincerity. We must be very sincere that we really want to follow. We want to be a devotee. We don't want to cheat. So we take the Krishna conscious process very seriously. Srila Prabhupada said, I am, I'm, he was giving initiation, he said, I am giving the diksha, I'm giving the, that, he said, this is a ritual, it's up to you how you practice the process. If we are sincere, then we will practice very carefully. You understand? Yes, Maharaj, thank you. Hare Krishna, okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, here in Dhruva's case, we see Narada Muni is coming and instructing, so he was able to meet the Lord. But what about the case of Gajedra and uh, Kumaras? Who was instructing them so that they were successful? Well, they had the samskar from previous life. Gajendra, in his previous life, he was Indra Jumna, and he'd been cursed to become elephant. But whatever devotional advancement you make, you don't lose it. So because they had already practiced something in previous life, so they rem could remember it. This is what happened. It, because, you, because in the previous life, he had been a Indra Jumna Maharaj, and he had received the mantra. He'd been told the mantra. And so when, when the crocodile was c fighting with him, at a certain point, then Gajendra remembered the mantra which had been given to him. And he began to offer the mantra and praise, praise the Lord. So it was there from the past, previous lifetime. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Actually, this one 